Ciao everyone and welcome back to Grow Talks. I'm Raffaele Gaito, your host, and my guest today is Kyle Hagi. Hi Kyle. Hey Raphael, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. How are you today? I've never been better. It's a great day to have a great day. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So Kyle, uh, usually on this podcast, we start with a simple one. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, your background, your story, uh, what you love, uh, what yeah. you're doing now, whatever you think it's interesting. For sure. Um, so right now, my current position is I'm lead community manager at Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a digital media company, mostly known for a daily newsletter that goes out to 4.25 million people every single morning, probably one of the largest, if not the largest daily newsletters, certainly in the States, maybe in the world. Um, but like any good media company, we're always expanding into different areas. So now we have different newsletters around certain verticals like emerging tech, HR brew, CFO brew, helping you make better decisions at work. We have multimedia, so videos on YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, social, obviously all that. And then the main area that I'm focused on is consumer revenue. So going direct to consumers, both selling them utility products like a mouse pad that has like Excel shortcuts on it, but uh, really focused on our education products uh, where I uh, run the community team. Our education products are um, seven to eight week courses on leadership or business analytics or business essentials. We have one week courses on very particular topics like financial forecasting or data storytelling or having difficult conversations at work. And I'm uh, both kind of helping people figure out what course is right for them, running the courses, emceeing the gas, moderating the events, and then managing our alumni community. Um, getting here was quite a journey. And I know we're going to talk about books later, but I'll, I'll leak one now. That is Range by David Epstein um, about why generals will triumph in a world full of specialists. One of my favorite books, probably the most impactful book I've read in my career. I feel, uh, I, I felt like I was like, present in that book. And it was the whole idea was that having a large sampling period where, where you're trying a lot of different things can actually be quite an effective way to grow your career and end up in a place where you have a very differentiated skill set that allows you to thrive in ways that maybe people with a more traditional path wouldn't. And, and that's exactly how my path has been. I studied philosophy and political science in school. So two degrees that really set you up to not have a job, highly recommend them. And then I did AmeriCorps. So many people are familiar with the Peace Corps. There's also something called AmeriCorps, which is a similar philosophy of service. But instead of going abroad, you do it in the States. And so I was teaching in Milwaukee uh, two years through AmeriCorps at a school called Milwaukee High School of the Arts. Then I got my master's through an economic and social justice fellowship at Marquette University, got my master's in political science, and I was working for the housing authority working on a really uh, interesting initiative um, on kind of neighborhood development. So I went from philosophy of political science to teaching to neighborhood development. I then started my own podcast. So congrats on, on starting yours and, and the success that you've had called Bridge the City. That was all about community activism or community engagement, where we would interview everyone from the mayor of Milwaukee to community activists to business leaders with a really specific focus on if you're looking to get more involved in your community, if you're looking to make an impact locally, what are the best ways to do that? So that got me kind of hooked on podcasting. I then became a uh, full-time podcaster, believe it or not, uh, paid for by Marquette University, where I worked with their innovator in residence. We had a podcast called Innovators on Tap, where we interviewed some of the world's best entrepreneurs and leaders, and uh, mainly in business, about innovation. And the host was the former CEO of Cree, so he, uh, a publicly traded company that really revolutionized the LED light bulb. So we had a lot of great thoughts on um, innovation, obviously. And then I took the job with Morning Brew. I moved to New York and, and here I am two years later still with the company. So that is a brief uh, introduction of how I've got here, but I've done a, a few different things. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Uh, would you say that you are a, a T-shaped profile i mean it looks like it uh, right with a lot of these different you know experiences and different projects you know uh different environment as well yeah it's a great question i would probably say yes i am t-shaped although 
maybe everyone describes themselves as such. But I do think that there is a misconception in the whole generalist versus specialist debate. What I what I what I normally hear is like, oh, specialists, you just focus on one thing and you get really good at that thing and, and that makes you a specialist. Generalist, you try a lot of different things and that somehow makes you like uh, you have an interesting skill set and then you're able to apply it. I, while though that isn't not true, I, I think really what generalism is about is the idea of you're still focused on getting good at one thing, but the idea is that if you want to get good at X, instead of only doing X, um, you should also do Y and Z. And that by doing Y and Z, it actually makes you better at X because you have a larger skill set in order to connect different dots, to be more innovative, to be more creative. And so like, you should still have a focus and you should still have something that you want to become excellent in. But I think generalism is just approaching it that if you want to get good at basketball, you shouldn't only play basketball. And oftentimes when you look at elite athletes, they play other sports much longer uh, into their life than you think they would. They're, they're, they have a large sampling period. Roger Federer is a perfect example of this. Anyway, I won't get into too many anecdotes, but um, yeah, I think it's really important to try different things, but not just to try them, but to focus them and bring some skills back to what you're trying to become excellent at. Uh, tell us more about it. I mean, uh, you said that you also had a, like a sampling period, you know, where you were yeah. like experimenting a lot. Yeah. How, how was that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I will say a lot of this, again, has been influenced by Range, by David Epstein. I've actually interviewed David myself before and couldn't recommend the book or his writing more. Um, so, yeah, in terms of like um, the sampling period or kind of teasing that idea out, I think oftentimes when you are, let's say you're in college, people start asking you, hey, what do you want to do? And maybe you have decided that you're going to be an accountant. Okay, so you're 20. And the idea that you can pick exactly what you want to do at, at 20 that you're going to want to do at 30 or 40 uh, is, is tough. And there's this idea, this concept called the um, illusion of history or history, uh, end of history illusion. That basically says that we recognize we've changed so much in the past till now, but when we forecast in the future, when we think of our future self, we don't anticipate us changing much, which is, you know, it, it, it's not really true. We will change just as much in the future as we have in the past pretty much. And so the idea that you can really pick a particular topic that you're going to want to do in 20 years from now when you're 20 seems a bit preposterous to me. And so I, I think um, not that eventually you don't have to pick But I think it's probably healthy to expand that sampling period out for most people until you're 25, 26, 27, give yourself five, six more years to try a lot of different things. I think we, we think we can intuit what we like, but it's really tough. And Herminia Barra, another social scientist, has a lot of great research around this. The only way you really figure out what you like to do is by doing it. And so you can think that you won't like something, you can intuit it, but it's, it's, there's no correlation with that actually being accurate. And so give yourself five, six years to explore a lot of different things, connect or collect a lot of different dots and then connect them in the future in a really unique way. You're going to have better fit because when you're sampling, you're just trying to find good fit. Like, what do I actually really like to do? What am I naturally talented at? And once you find that fit, you're going to be a much more creative individual because instead of the normal accounting path, Oh, yeah, I'm an accountant, but I did Peace Corps for two years and it gave me this unique perspective uh, that often becomes valuable. You do feel a little behind in your career early on when you choose this route, I will admit, and that's often cited. But when you follow people's career trajectories, it is people that have a large sampling period or larger compared to their peers that do end up typically um, having, quote unquote, the most successful careers, making the most money, the number one indicator of Uh, who become CEOs typically, and they've done a big research across, I think like all the Fortune 500 companies, is the person that's worked in the most different functions. So if you've had someone that came up as an analyst and then worked in marketing and then maybe joined the, you know, the community team and like they understand a lot of the different functions and obviously they're smart and they keep accelerating, it's that person that ends up becoming the CEO because they understand so many different elements of the business. Hmm. I love it. I like it. And do you think that somehow uh this you know this 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 process the this journey also helped you 
uh, in what you are doing now? I mean, as a you know community expert, community manager, and whatever. Yes, I couldn't agree more. That is a fantastic insight. <clears throat> I think one of the things about community is I'd actually say like a specialized skill in being a great community leader, community manager is actually like being a generalist. Like you specialize in being a generalist <laughs> because, you know, a community like ours where we have professionals from every walk of life across all of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, different roles, different years of experience, different industries, you have to be able to relate to a broad swath of people. And I've been fortunate to work in nonprofits, to work in media, to work uh, for government entities, to work for corporations, to work with great community activists, to great business leaders and everything in between. And so I would say I know a little bit about a lot and that it gives me an ability to ask questions, ask really thoughtful questions to anyone that works almost in any type of industry or role. And that's really partly about what being the job, uh, being great at the job is all about. Are you relatable to your community? If your community is very broad and very diverse, then you better have a broad, diverse set of experiences in which to have conversations around. Um, and then how you know, well are you able to articulate those questions based on your previous experiences? If you only have had one set of experience in your life, your ability to ask questions uh, is probably pretty limited to that data set. If you've had a broad set of experiences, you can ask broad and expansive questions. So I think it's, it's very, very important. And then the other element I would say is having um, a broad set of experiences, you also then are very conscientious of building experiences or building community for different types of people. And, you know, I think this is a common mistake is that people so much like they'll build a community and they'll think only of like how they themselves would go through it. So maybe you're like a extrovert, you love like big events. And so if you build a community, you're like, well, what do people want to do? Oh, they're just like me. They want big events all the time. And while some people will, you've actually created this situation where people that don't like that don't see themselves reflected in the community. They're not going to stick around. And so by having a broad set of experiences, interacting with a broad set of people, you also start to understand that, oh, you know, breaking news, not everyone thinks like me. Some people like these, you know, really high energy events. Maybe some people are comfortable like we're having now with one-on-one -on -one conversations. Maybe some people like text-based forums because it's not live. They can be more thoughtful. It's, it's asynchronous. And you can really start to construct a durable community where no matter who you are, you can see yourself in a little bit. No matter who you are, there's an experience for you inside that community. I think it makes your communities a lot more sticky um, and, and it makes them a lot better of experiences for most of your customers. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. And let's stay on the community topic. Um, I yeah. always say to you know my clients, my students, that uh, communities are an asset. For a company, a community is an asset, and uh, you should probably build a community before you build the product or the service that you sell. Um, do you have any suggestions on that? You know, any tips and tricks, anything that you learned mm. in your experience? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I do have some. I, I, I think I'll preface this with saying that I think community is important. Obviously, it's in my title. It's, it's how I pay the bills right now. It's very important and it's very transformational. I think anytime you think of a moment in your life that you've had extraordinary growth, you've had a transformation yourself, you've changed your mind on something, it's often because you had a community, you had a support system. Uh, I, I think that people change through their relations with others. And I don't think that's ever going to go away. So community is such a fundamental human concept that it, obviously it's valuable to build. That being said, I think that we're in, we're kind of emerging out of it, but we definitely, if you asked me this a year ago, we were in like everything needs a community. If you're selling toilet paper, you better have a Charmin community. If you're selling razors, you need to have a community of people that go crazy for your razors. Yeah, that that's all good, but it's like really think through like what is that community going to do? You, you mentioned it like a community is an asset. Okay. Do you have a plan on how like you're actually going to use that asset? Like 
is your core competency building a community around toilet paper or is your core competency building the best toilet paper in the world? And like, they're two different skill sets. So just being very conscientious of like, if we go down this community path, do we have the right talent on our team to pull it off? Is this something that, you know, people are actually going to want to invest in because it's quite easy to hit kind of like community. Um, like you, you, you can only be part of so many communities. Like, I swear I buy socks now and they're like, Hey Kyle, do you want to join our exclusive like sock community? No, I don't like that. <laughs> I, I just don't, I'm already in so many. So being really thoughtful just about like why you're building the community and what the, the purpose is of that it, it is kind of my first caveat. But you know, if you've done all the work and you've decided like, Hey, no, we're going to invest in this. We're going to bring the right talent on. And, and there's a clear reason why we're building this community. Then I definitely think for a variety of reasons, which we can get into, it's one of the smartest things your your business can do. You know, I work in media, so I often think about it as like audience versus community. And I would say that the Morning Brew newsletter, it's an audience. It's one to many. So it's Morning Brew, one to many, 4.25 million readers. But the readers themselves don't really interact with each other, one to many. Community, I define as many to many. So that's where other people can interact with other people, can interact with other people. It's like if your audience was interacting with each other. And that's exactly what we do in our courses. So we bring people together from our audience and we form community where they're not just learning from the best, you know, us and the speakers we bring in, but they're learning from each other as well. I think that's truly transformational. I think it creates a tremendous brand loyalty around your product. Um, and it allows you to, I think, generate more revenue from your customer base uh, through these community activities. So um, I definitely think it's a smart thing for every business to consider obviously be realistic and make sure you have a plan in place and that your, your audience actually wants to be a community. And if so, um, then it's one of the smartest business decisions you can make. What do you mean by having a, a plan in place? Uh, what's a plan for you? I mean, in yeah. this case, you know, regarding uh, building a community. Yeah. 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 So I think uh, what most people would get wrong about like communities and I mainly like building like digital communities is they're like, Oh, community. That's just like a Slack channel. So our plan is like quite simple. What if we put everyone that likes us in a Slack channel and then they can just do whatever they want? That's a community, right? It's like, I don't know about you, but I've been in a lot of Slack channels and half of them, I'll be honest, are shit because it's just like, they're, why are we here? There's no set of shared experiences we've gone through. There's no structure. It's just like, oh, you all like marketing? Now you're in this Slack that seemingly is chaos and it's just like more distraction And I think that's when people are like, oh, you don't actually have a plan. What are the like uh, experiences or programming, excuse me, you're going to deliver to your audience? How are people supposed to, how are you creating expectations around how people are supposed to act? What is the value you're bringing to that community? All of these things that I've seen so many people just like not really think through. What I believe is the core pillar of community that needs to happen for anything else is shared experience. I think that shared experience is the ultimate unlock of creating community. If you think about, um, you know, wherever you went to university, if you, if you did go to university, um, you know, it's typically like that shared experience of the first week. That's why they have you do onboarding and they like put you in little groups and you get to meet people right away and you go through these, these common sets of experiences You know, if you played sports growing up, you're traveling on the road with your team and you're like going through all of these shared experiences that bond you together. It gives you things to relate to. It helps you understand different people. It gives you a shared language. And what's really hard and what I see a lot of companies fuck up with is that they put people on Slack. Well, we've never had a shared experience together prior to this. And like it's really hard to build shared experience through like a, a Slack based forum. So what we do is before you get to our alumni Slack or our digital community, you have to go through an eight week program with other people. That's much more deliberate, much more structured, much more intimate. We cap it at 150 participants. You also get a small group inside of that larger group that you do many activities with. And by doing that, we're creating shared experience. We're creating community. We're creating the relationship between people before we port them over to Slack. Now, if you know everyone on Slack already, or you have a shared language already, you have those shared experiences, that's when I think you get a lot of value out of a digital community. But if you just cold start it and throw people in Slack without a plan, without a, a way to create shared experiences between people, 
people are going to churn so fast um, and it's just not going to be an enjoyable uh, place to be. I suppose that that's quite easy if you're like, you know, a, a big company or at least if you have a big team. What if you are like a startup, uh, you know, a small business or even a freelance? How do you think you can manage a community in that case? You know, uh, like, let's say, uh, I don't know, a startup with I don't know, five, five people. Uh, mm -hmm. Should the, you know, the founders do that? So be also the community builder and, and manager? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think in some ways the founder or the CEO is like the ultimate community builder and storyteller of the company. So part of me wants to say, yes, I understand that there's like caveats there. Um, if like you have a, a, a small team, but I think the idea is not so much like the scale. It's more like, are you creating experiences that will actually like bring people together again? Like if you're, if you're a founder and you have a five person team and I'm, I'm happy for like pushback on this and you're trying to invent like some, you know, the led light bulb to use an example from my past that I was talking about, like you're, you're, I don't think you should like be focused on like building a community around that. I think you should be focused on the actual figure out the fucking light bulb. That is your core competency. And that's what you need to be focused on. And after you have the product or the experience or like whatever you're building, the good or service, then think about, all right, if it's selling and we have an audience, how do we turn that audience into community and offer them different experiences or upsell them or, or do whatever. But in, in the early days, again, depending on what your product is, it just might not be the time to like build a, a community. I, I know you mentioned like build a community before you have the product. I, I think it, it just, that it depends on what the product is. Um, you know, if you're building in public, which is so many people talk about now and like you're building a community around your, the growth as you're like, I, I definitely think that's good. Like you're just getting more eyeballs for sure. But you know, if you're the founder of some tech company, upstart and you're trying to create some crazy technology you should be focused on creating that crazy technology and not in like some slack with a could be customer of a product that hasn't yet built yet so it's going to depend on on the type of company but that would be my take and what what do you see in terms of of trends uh you know how communities are changing um, especially now in this, uh, somehow call it, you know, the post pandemic world. Uh, so we had like a couple of years, you know, where everyone was in lockdown, everyone was <laughs> online, everyone was spending a lot of time also in online communities. Uh, what are the trends that you see in the community world? It's a great question. I think that there's a few trends going on. The first is definitely the bar for a digital community has been raised. Uh, during COVID, you couldn't do anything outside or in real life, you know, really. And so your, your digital community was competing with like the next episode of Tiger King on Netflix. Like that was your competition. And there was nothing, nothing in the real world that you actually had to compete with. Now, guess what? You're competing with two people leaving their house and going to the bar and meeting friends, grabbing a drink. You're competing with sports. You're competing with the physical world and the digital world. Therefore, you have to be that much better than the alternatives. It's kind of just basic like game theory. And so I do think that the bar has been raised and you have to be a much more intentional if you're going to build digital community. That's not just a good digital community, but it's a good community, period, uh, because you're competing uh, with physical uh, communities. I think the other trend is not having just an in real life experience or just a virtual experience community, but a hybrid. So this is something that we see all the time. We have a digital presence. We have a Slack. We do virtual programming. I would say we're mainly digital based, but we have channels where people can meet other people in real life in their cities because we have alumni all across the country. So if your community can create or facilitate in real life connection, then I think that is like the unlock. Like you're, you're kind of fulfilling both of these needs. We all want to be part of something digitally. We want to all be part of something in real life. And if your community can provide both, then uh, I think that's really strong. The, the last thing I'll say, so we have like digital just has to be better because now you're competing with more things. 
Second is try to create hybrid experiences across the, the timeline of your community. I would say the third thing is I think intimacy is making a comeback. Uh, I think that sometimes you measure a community or what I would often see is like, oh, we have like 10,000 people in our community. We have 1 million people in our community. That it has pros and cons. And I think it is, you know, it's a metric that people like to share how big their community is. But I do think that there's a limit to like one, just like how many people another person can realistically keep in their head. But the real, tra again, transformational moments, at least in my life, have been like a small, intimate setting of like five or six other people. And so if you have a large community, my like biggest tip to you is find a way to segment that community and form groups of like six uh, or 10 or 15 more intimate subgroups inside your community, because that is often where people find the most value and uh, find the most like identity inside your community. To give another like university example, I went to the University of Minnesota. There's 60 some thousand kids that go every like four years or like that's the total number of kids at the school. Did I meet every single one? No. Did I walk into every single building at the University of Minnesota? No. But if you ask me, hey, do you, did you like the university? I would say yes. Well, how can I say that? It's because I had six or seven or 10 core friends that the university did a great job of facilitating connection through whether that's classes or extracurricular activities. And because I really enjoy those people and some of the experiences that the university allotted to me, it has a halo effect. And I'm now like, wow, the whole community of University of Minnesota, I love. Now, if they just put me in and I had to meet all 60,000 people and we were just in one big auditorium, like that would be a shitty community. So yeah, numbers are cool and having a larger community is better in some ways. But if you can't segment it into smaller subgroups, I think you're really going to struggle with having a lasting community and having any sort of impact on the members of your community. But how do you, how do you do that? I mean, how do you segment in the right way? Is it by topic or, I mean, the example of you at the university, uh, that's quite natural. If you think about it, there, there mm -hmm. was no segmenting, you know, it was not a, a top down process it was a, a bottom up process. So how do you yep. do that in a community? Yeah, it's a great question. So we do like bottom up uh, process in our alumni community where basically like anyone can make a certain channel on Slack, for example. So we have some that are like founders. So outside, you know, inside of the about 1700 professionals we have, there's probably like 30 or 40 like really active founders that really want to connect with other founders. They have their own space inside our digital community where they can just talk to founders. And maybe we do specific programming for that particular subset. Then there's people that are interested in marketing. So you can slice it by occupation or role. You can slice it by geography. So we have a New York City channel. We have a Boston channel. We have a Minneapolis channel. We have a Denver channel. We have a Bay Area channel. So you can also do it by uh, geography. You could do it by years of experience if you're a more professional community. So these are for 15 plus years of experience, probably have shared professional challenges at that uh, stage in your career. Uh, if you're fresh out of college, maybe you need different resources and you want to talk to other people that um, are in that same strata. So I think there's a million different ways you can cut it, whether that is asking your audience, like, you know, what are the types of channels or uh, subgroups you'd like to see? Um, or just using your own experience of what's been impactful in your own life. Um, there's definitely different ways to get at that, but I, you, you have to have some sort of subgroup. Even when we run our like eight week courses, like I was mentioning, we have 150 people. So you're going to have experiences where it's live and all 150 are you there and we bring in an awesome guest speaker. It's high energy, but then you're going to do a case study together with just five other people. So it's you and six people. You're going to do a case study with those uh, same six people you're going to get a coaching session with those same six people. And so you form really close bonds with those six people, as opposed to having create bonds with all 150. And again, I think it's that halo effect. You find that core group, you service them really well, and then they really like your whole community. Um, and I, I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. It's like the bigger is not always better. If you are enjoying this episode, please check out my lead generation course. You can watch it for free on gaito.link slash Skillshare, G-A-I-T-O. As an entrepreneur, marketer or business owner, you know how crucial 
lead generation is. In this course, I'll be sharing with you 20 proven tactics for lead generation in both B2B and B2C markets. You can watch it for free on gaito.link slash Skillshare, G-A-I-T-O. You'll find the link in the description. Um, how community are changing in terms of, um, in terms of platforms? Uh, for example, you know, a few years ago, everything was a, like a Facebook group, a LinkedIn group. Now everything is on Slack or Discord, you know, or Telegram. Uh, yes, great question. Uh, this is my take. The technology is on the margins. So the platform is on the margins. And I really believe this. I think that so many times people spend all day and all night thinking, should this be a Discord community? Should this be a Slack community? Should this be a Facebook? I, I don't think that platform is destiny when it comes to building community. I think it's all on the margins. What is really gonna matter is do you have the right community members? Are you providing the best experiences for them? Um, are you actually providing value? Do you understand why they're in your community? Is your community serving that need? Do they feel like they're listened to? Are you implementing their feedback? And you can do that on Discord. You can do that on Slack. You could do that in real life group at the park. Like that shit, I mean, it, it matters because you got to pick something, but I wouldn't worry so much about the tech. I would worry about the experience. I think it's the same thing. And, and oftentimes people just get so caught up in like, I want to use the newest and the latest and the greatest piece of technology. I think if you're gonna do digital events, there will always be the question, should we use Zoom or should we use something else? And someone's gonna pitch, we should use, um, I'm blanking on all these names, but there's like 500 companies now doing virtual events. Um, one is called Remo. I'm not like, if you work for Remo and you're listening to this, the, the platform's cool, I'm sure it serves a purpose. And like, this is not to hate on it, but I'm using you as an example. So please, <laughs> please forgive me. I've done Remo events where like you show up and then you can like sit at a virtual table and it, it's, it's like kind of cool, but it's, it, it's, it's really confusing to like get in, get, get used to and use. And I'm thinking of like, what if I'm someone who's like 50 years old and like, I'm just kind of trying to figure out Zoom, Remo is going to kill you. Like you're not gonna know what's going on. And you're actually not able to enjoy the experience because you picked a platform that requires such a high learning curve, requires you to be such a digital native, requires you to understand what's going on where it's almost a distraction to the actual experience. This is why I think Zoom, people, people hate on it. It's actually the best platform. Why? Because it's the one that has the most adoption. It's the one that most people know the best. And I don't know about you, but when I go to an event, I'm not going there because I love Zoom or I love Microsoft Teams or I love Remo. I'm going there for the experience, whether that's to hear a speaker, whether that's to get connected with other participants. And so the tech should fade to the background. It should be so intuitive. It should be so easy that it is not a distraction to the actual reason you're there, which is to enjoy the experience. And so while platform matters, I think it's on the margins, uh, you know, use maybe what you think you're most comfortable with or that your audience will be most comfortable with. But I really hesitate to recommend anything that's super, super new or super, super like cutting edge because your community is only going to be people that are early adopters that are comfortable with that stuff. Now, if it's a community of like early tech adopters and maybe you're fine for us, it's a community of professionals from, you know, 20 year careers or two year careers and everything in between. We need the platform that is most recognizable, most understandable, that fades into the background so people can actually be there to get the experience they want. For us, that's Slack, which has pretty much become ubiquitous. It's Zoom, which has pretty much become ubiquitous. So yeah, I think spend some time thinking about platform, spend a lot less. I think that is a mistake a lot of community builders make. Spend way more time designing actually kick-ass experiences and kind of no matter where they are, uh, if you design the experience right, it'll, it'll work out. So the takeaway here is uh, experience before the platform and people yes. before the tools. Yes, a hundred percent. Like, Always. yeah. I mean, if you can get a great speaker, um, you know, I'll watch that person on a Game Boy Color. Like, shit. Like, <laughs> it's amazing. You know, you could have you could have the coolest platform, and I'm wearing VR, and I'm like, you know. But if the event itself sucks, it sucks. And then two yeah, maybe you think VR is cool and you're like using Oculus and you understand it, but does like 
John Johnson, 65 years old, who just like dropped his kids off at work and is like tired, really want to put on this crazy headset to like go into the metaverse to like do. I just don't think that's true. So know your audience. And if your audience is broad, use something ubiquitous. Don't try to be fancy with it. That isn't the thing that people are coming to your community for. I, I had a question for you about the metaverse. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask give now. My hand away. Yeah, please do. Uh, I'm going to ask now. So th what about the metaverse? Do you think there's future there for the, for the communities? Um, I think eventually there will be. Mm. And I know I probably came off as a metaverse hater. And that last answer, I, I've never personally put on like an Oculus, so I, I can't really speak to the experience. Um, But I do think that a technology like that, I can imagine in the future, is pretty seamless. It feels real. Um, and then, sure, that's pretty cool. It's a great way to connect virtually. Um, right now, I think that the tech is not where it needs to be for mass adoption. My understanding is that, excuse me, um, wearing the technology like gives people headaches. It's very disorienting. I know we're still like trying to figure out how to put hands in the metaverse. So I don't think the tech is quite there yet. If I was building a broad community, I would not even be thinking about the metaverse. I think it's one of those things where it's cool, it's trendy, and Facebook is setting billions of dollars on fire every day trying to build it. Um, but it's not really ready for real time, in my opinion. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't l look at it right now if i was like trying to build a community i just don't think it's like practical enough uh to really matter it's it kind of pains me to say but i do think eventually yeah it's gonna take off because you know it's like early it's like chat gpt or crypto or the metaverse like people it, it starts and you have people that are super into it and like think it's going to totally change the world and are like diehard fans and And then everyone's like, holy shit, is crypto going to change the world? And then like reality sets in and a lot of the bullshit goes away. But then the, like the real use cases will survive. And then in, you know, 15, 20 years, we'll actually see what this thing is, is useful for. Right now, I think we're in the bullshit phase of the metaverse where like everyone just puts metaverse on a deck to like convince a company that to give them, you know, McKinsey some money or something. But I, I've, I haven't seen really any real practical applications for it, but th they will exist for sure. It's kind of like the, the arc of technology. Uh, but right now, I want to be focused on it. Sorry, that was a, a long answer. No, 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 no. Makes sense. Makes totally sense. <laughs> um, and, and I agree. I, I also totally agree with you. Um, uh, so, Kyle, usually in the last part of this uh, podcast, uh, we talk a little about, uh, you know, books and, and tools also. Uh, yes. So you already uh, gave us uh, a great book. Um, what else are you reading right now? Or, you know, do you have any book that it's really important for you or something pretty cool that you have read in the last couple of years? Yeah. You know? I love this question. I'm, I'm also curious about your answer. Um, so I mentioned Range by David Epstein. A book I just finished is called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari. Uh, What's the name basically, again? Stolen. Stolen Focus. Okay. And the concept of the book is basically, hey, why the hell can't we pay attention anymore? I feel it. I'm sure you feel it. I'm sure everyone listening feels it. We got pings, rings, dings, every sort of distraction out of the sun. And I think we just have a sense that our, our attention span ain't what it used to be. And it's a whole exploration of, of what's going on. He identifies, I think, 12 causes from everything of how we eat to how we sleep to how technology is really interwoven into every element of our life. And It, it's, a, it's a really powerful book. And I think the premise basically is that if we can't pay attention, how are we expecting to solve anything? When we have to solve a climate crisis or any big issue that takes huge collective action, if we can't even pay attention for 15 seconds, we're never going to solve something critical to humanity. It's a really eye-opening book. He's been on the podcast circuit. He has lots of great interviews. So definitely check that book out. And then my other book that I love this is such a great question i can talk about books all day is um a short history of nearly everything by bill bryson it's basically the history of science but i know that sounds so incredibly boring he's actually made it quite fun uh, so shout out to bill for pulling that off 
but just a great look at like how science has evolved our life on the planet. And I think you leave it feeling extra human and extra grateful that we get, you know, a hundred years to float on this little rock we call earth and might as well make the most of it, but really an understanding of how impractical and improbable it is that, that we're all alive. Um, and, and some, some really cool science facts as well. So that's another book I love. Um, maybe I'll leave with, with those three. What's your like go-to book? Uh, I love the last one. Uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, nice. It's going to be in my wish list in a couple of <laughs> minutes. <laughs> and guys, you'll find all the links uh, in the description below. Uh, and also, we had a great um, episode on the podcast related to, you know, distraction and, and focus, uh, mm. what you were talking about with Neil Real. So go check it out. Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, so what I'm reading right now, I'm finishing uh, a great book, actually, about, you know, science uh and innovation it's called how we got to now yeah uh, the six inventions that made the <laughs> modern world my friend uh, i'm not kidding just gave me that book it is on my coffee table right now yeah it's amazing Deadass. i loved it i loved it i loved it hell yeah, well, yeah all right well now it. i'm loved excited it. to read it yeah yeah go for it i loved it <laughs> uh, uh and i think i have like pr probably 10 or 20 pages left uh, okay. And next one is going to be from zero to AI. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, a hype free uh, book uh, regarding, you know, the whole AI uh, movement and everything that is, you know, going on mm. uh, right now in the world. Um, AI is super interesting. AI. Yeah. yeah. I was just I was just talking about that yesterday. I think, yeah, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> um, and last one, uh, tools. So... Do you have any like uh, cool tools uh, in your tool set that you use in your day-to-day -day, uh, job? You know, marketing tools, business yeah. tools, uh, whatever you think it's, uh, you know, uh, interesting for, for my audience. For sure. I have a bunch. Um, even though I know I was like hating on like tools before. They're very valuable. Just like know what you're doing with them. Yeah. Uh, one I use is Vimcal. It's a calendar app. Um, uh, it, it's super important, particularly if you work in community. It, it has like customizable links. It's like... If Calendly and your like email merged is kind of like Vimcal, is how I describe it. Um, we use Airtable for keeping track of everything. That's a well-known one. Slack, HubSpot, and then one that maybe is less familiar is something called Intros AI. Intros AI. It's basically an automated platform that allows your community to facilitate one-on-one -on -one coffee chats between people. So you mm -hmm. sign up. You can ask certain questions. They have a, a logic tree that will pair people appropriately based on their responses inside your community. Again, I think that's the best. I think communities that are multimodal allow you to connect in large groups and in one-on-one -on -one conversations and everything in between are the most effective ones. So I found Intros AI to be very effective for our community and, again, facilitating those one-on-one -on -one, uh, connections. So maybe that's my, my plug for Intros AI. Nice, nice. Uh, all the links as well, you know, of the tools that are going to be in the descriptions Perfect. below. Um, Kyle, before saying bye, yeah. uh, where they can, you know, find you, uh, follow you, read you? Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm on all the normal stuff. Twitter, at Kyle Hagee. LinkedIn, Kyle Hagee. My email, kyle at morningbrew.com. I live in New York. I'm not going to give you my address, but you can maybe you'll see me around or something. Um and yeah, that that's where I live on the internet. Can 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 I can I can I give one more thing too? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go All for right. it. All right. So I, I also wrote this article at Morning Brew. It's like four tips and tricks to creating and sustaining a community. And I think it, it will probably be valuable for your audience um, because we talked about that. But I think one thing that I really like in this article, well, two things is the first is one of the points is that community managers are architects and not stars. And I think that's important for everyone to understand. If you want to work in community, it's not about you. You're the architect building the building and making sure that, you know, you walk in, the signage is clear and people that come into your community understand where they need to go. But you're not the star. It's not about you. And so the, the more you can remember that the most effective communities, I think, have community managers that are built, are building experiences that help other people and not just give them the limelight. And then the second thing that I think is often really it's a superpower that your community can give you is feedback. I see so many people create a community, think they understand all the answers. Communities are emergent properties. They're going to grow based on 
um, the people inside of them. It's impossible to predict exactly where it's going to go. The best communities are ones that are always soliciting feedback from members and then actually, you know, doing something with that feedback. And then my last pro tip is when you survey people, my biggest pet peeve is when someone surveys me and then I never f know like what they end up doing with that survey. Every time we survey our audience in our community, we will respond like personally, like, hey, we really love this feedback. Here's what we're going to do about it. Or, hey, we loved your feedback. It's a great idea. Here's why we can't do that right now. But the recognition is transformational. So many people are like, oh, wow, you actually read what I wrote. Like, talk about building buy-in for your community. So if you're going to survey your community, tell them what the fuck you did with it. Or like, I, I just can't fill out another survey that I'm like, D is anyone listening? So anyway, I'll, I'll send you that link or we can link it below as well. Um, but it's a great little article and yeah, reach out to me if you're interested in anything I've said and would love to chat. Yeah. I love this last, uh, you know, this last part, uh, and I'll put the blog post in the description as well. Uh, Perfect. so Kyle, thank you so much. Thanks a lot <laughs> for your time for the inside tips and tricks that you gave us today. Thank you. And have being on your side of the, po uh, podcast many a time, uh, congrats to you. It's, it's no small feat to knock out these conversations to have, you know, people on and share their story and um, it, clearly you, you know what you're doing. So it's, it's really cool. And congratulations on the community you've built with this podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. See you, Raphael. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and Spotify to stay updated on new episodes. With your support, I can continue to bring great content and great guests to this podcast. So hit the subscribe button now and I'll see you in the next episode.